Well, again, until someone tells me, someone tells me what they mean by God, I would have to. I can't answer that question. It's like, do I rule out the possibility of life on other planets? It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. And I will submit it to you in all. No, I'm not going to say humility. Um, I just submit it to you, okay? <laughs> there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. And again, if this was the plan, was it made by someone who likes us? Well, that's another question. <laughs> and if so, why have 99.9% .9 of all the other species that have ever been created uh, already died out? And part of what plan was that? You see, if uh, it is a plan or a design and one cannot positively prove that it is not, it only restates the original problem. The planner must be either very capricious, really toying with his, with his creation, very, or very, and or very clumsy, very tinkering, and fantastically wasteful. Throw away 99.9% .9 of what you've made. Um, I don't know. I mean, it depends on the argument. Or very cruel and very callous, or just perhaps very indifferent, or some combination of all the above. And so it's no good saying that he moves in mysterious ways, or that he has purposes that are opaque to us, because even that kind of evasion has to make itself predicate on the assumption that the person saying this knows more than I do. Mm -hmm. So in essence, I, I guess I'm open in principle. It's just that I've heard, I've been, in this, you know, been an atheist for many years now and involved myself in a lot of debates, and I've... I think I've heard most of the arguments I'm going to hear. Mm -hmm. So someone's going to have to come up with something new to convince mm -hmm. me. About the supernatural. And I haven't yet met anyone who does have a private line to the creator of the, of the sort that would be required even to speculate about it. Um, I've never met, in other words, I've never met anyone in holy orders or out of it who isn't also a primate. But nowadays... Francis Collins, the man who did the DNA decoding, the Human Genome Project, who is, by the way, another Christian scientist, or rather, scientist who is a Christian. Um, I won't make that mistake again. Um, we are in rebellion against the image of the authoritarian father. You know what Mark Twain said about the work of Mary Baker Eddy, the Christian science writer, founder of it, her books? Chloroform in print. Um, <laughs> This is an aggression. It's a digression. And just one more point before I bring Greg Bonson, Greg Bonson into this, but in terms of background, and I don't mean to get ad hominem, but I mean, did you have any type of religious training? I was, uh, I considered religion? myself a fundamentalist Christian until about sophomore, junior, in high, well, about a sophomore in high school. I was uh, devoutly religious. I had many what I called religious experiences. Uh, my family was not especially religious, but I was. Uh, I, I prayed. I went to, I was uh, working church services. I got my God and Country Merit Badge in the Boy Scouts. I was a model Christian child by all indications, and uh, things happened. I had discussed that in my latest book. Mm -hmm. There's an essay called My Path to Atheism, mm -hmm. where I go through the deconversion process, mm -hmm. as I call it. And when you say uh, you, know, you, had this, you were religious, did you, did you consider a personal relationship with Jesus Christ oh, yes. part of what you had? Yes, very much so. Because some people would make a differentiation no, no, between I was, religion uh, and relationship. Well, I was raised on Air Force bases. The churches were technically non-denominational, mm -hmm. but my experience was, so I can't say it was Baptist or any particular theology, but uh, I, was, I considered myself a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. I, I, I accepted what I considered to be a literal belief in the Bible, etc. Mm -hmm. Dr. Greg Bonson, and you're doctored from USC in epistemology, and as a Christian theologian, of course, you have done many debates and written in the area of God's existence. So where does one begin in presenting evidence for God? How would you uh, approach George Smith, for example? Francis Collins says at least 100,000 years. We for the first 80 or so, 90 or so thousand years, nearly 100, not living more than 25 to 30 years at the most, then probably dying of their teeth, if they were lucky, or of the other needless mammalian things that show us that we bear the stamp, as Darwin put it, of our lowly origin, the appendix we don't need anymore, innumerable other shortcomings of our design. We're, we're designed to live on the savannah that we've escaped from. Um, uh, terrible d disease, suffering, misery, malnutrition, and fear. Where do the earthquakes come from? Why is there an eclipse? What are the shooting stars doing? 
and awful cults of sacrifice to try and ward off what are in fact natural events, and war, and rape, and the kidnap of other peoples, and the enslavement of them. All of this goes on, gradually, gradually inching up to the point where you can brew beer, a breakthrough in my view, um, <laughs> domesticate animals, separate one kind of corn from another, so very millimetrical progress, but r terrible struggle, sacrifice, pain, misery, and above all, fear and ignorance. And you have to believe this if you believe in monotheism. But to reject the paternalistic image of God as an idol. For the first 97, 98,000 of this, heaven watches with indifference. Oh, there they go again. is not necessarily to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. the, and the reason I ask these is to try to, from my own understanding, determine whether you would fall into the category of what I would call a soft-boiled or a hard-boiled agnostic, or somebody that at least is open to discuss it, or you've totally ruled out any possibility of God's existence. They've all, this, that whole civilization's just died out. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I appreciate about George, I've only met him this afternoon, um, but I appreciate about his writings that he understands how important epistemology is to the whole discussion. They're raping each other again. They've, they've, they're poisoning, the, they think that the other tribe has poisoned the well, so they're going to kill all their children. All this, just watch all that. 3,000 years ago at the most, it's decided, no, we've got to intervene now. <laughs> Although I have advocated something called atheism in the name of God. That is to say, an experience, a contact, a relationship with God, that is to say, with the ground of your being. If we're going to talk about the existence of God, we're not going to want it uh, to reduce the question of emotion or just volitional commitment of some sort without uh, man's intellect being engaged. That does not have to be embodied or expressed in any specific image. And I think he's right about that. As Christians, we do not give up our intellect when we believe in God or follow the scriptures. Now, theologians on the whole don't like that idea. And so, um, since the issue is epistemology, this may not be what many of your hearers would like to get into, perhaps. But we need to talk about what amounts to proof and what amounts to knowledge and how these things are possible. Because I find in my discourse with them that they want to be a little bit hard-nosed about the nature of God. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, we have to be extremely critical. You have to believe it. You have to believe it. And the revelation is, must, be, must be personal, must appear. So we'll pick the most backward, the most barbaric, the most illiterate, the most superstitious and the most savage people we can find in the most stony area. Uh, I know that Christians often have the reputation for not being critically minded, and I, I think that's probably a, a failing on our part when we're like that. Of the, of the world, we won't appear to the Chinese who can already read. But if we're going to be critically minded, we need to examine the presuppositions of, of our thinking. They want to say that God has, indeed, a very specific nature. And um, we have to look at the worldview that we're espousing when we argue in a particular way or not. Ethical monotheism means that the governing power of this universe has some extremely definite opinions and rules. And so if, if I were, you know, talking with George over coffee, I think I would probably talk to him, first of all, about what outlook he has on the world. What does he conceive reality to be? How does he know what he knows? How should he live his life? To which our minds and acts must be conformed. And I would compare that to the Christian worldview, what we understand to be reality and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives. And if you don't watch out. And then, of course, we're going to have to eventually get to the point of deciding how does one choose one worldview over another. You'll go against the fundamental grain of the universe and be punished in some way. Uh, at some point, maybe after two or three cups of coffee, I would eventually challenge George that um, on an atheist worldview, the presuppositions of atheism do not provide a foundation for proving anything whatsoever. And therefore, in one sense, the strongest evidence and argument for the existence of God is that without a belief in God, you can't prove anything.
Old-fashionedly, you will burn in the fires of hell forever. More modern-fashionedly, you will fail to be an authentic person. It's another way of talking about it. <laughs> and so I would make that the foundation for reason. Um, often, and I think you'll see this if you read uh, George's book, you have people who present something of a Thomistic approach to faith and reason where faith um, fills in the gaps where reason uh, lets us down or is inadequate. But there is this feeling, you see, that there is authority behind the world and it's not you. Uh, my own theological perspective is more Augustinian rather than uh, Thomistic. And I would argue instead that uh, everything we do uh, engages the reason as a tool of man's intellect, but that the cogent use of reason is impossible apart from the foundation of faith. It's something else. Like we say, that's something else that's far out. <laughs> the most barbaric, the most illiterate, the most superstitious and the most savage people we can find in the most stony area of the of the world, we won't appear to the Chinese who can already read. This Jewish, Christian and indeed Muslim approach makes a lot of people feel rather strange, estranged from the root and ground of being. We won't appear in the Indus Valley where they know a thing or two and they're already, you know, they very far of us. No. We'll, we'll appear to this brutal, enslaved, hopeless, superstitious crowd and will force them to cut their way through every all of their neighbors with slaughter, genocide and racism and settle on the only part of the Middle East where there's no oil. There are a lot of people who never grow up and are always in awe of an image of grandfather. Now I'm a grandfather. I have five grandchildren and so I'm no longer in awe of grandfathers. I know I'm just as stupid as my own grandfathers were and uh, therefore I'm not about to bow down to an image of God with a long white beard. And all subsequent revelations occur in the same district. <laughs> and without this we wouldn't know right from wrong. <laughs> now. Now naturally of course. We intelligent people don't believe in that kind of a God, not really. Ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, brothers and sisters, <laughs> I know I'm capable of parody and, of, and in, at my lowest of sarcasm, and I've proved it to you, and sometimes I've got paid for it. But <laughs> in seriousness now, do I really, do I seriously mi misrepresent the situation? You must believe something like that happened, or did not, in order to address the whole question of where monotheism comes from. I mean, we think that God is spirit, that God is uh, very undefinable and infinite and all that kind of thing. But nevertheless, the images of God are far more, have a far more powerful effect upon our emotions than our ideas. You see, I would preach that to my Christian brothers and sisters. They need to you know, read the scriptures and use their minds and not simply have an emotional Christianity. I would say, it can't be proved that that isn't how we came to understand um, the, the, the morality and the need for it. But I would regard it in the light of the other evidence I've touched upon as being in the very highest degree improbable. But that would also be the premise that I would approach an atheist or an unbeliever with. That, that is the way we discovered how to think, uh, how to decide how to live with one another, what our duties are uh, to each other and so forth. I'd say that the best use of reason, in fact the only use of reason, comes about when Christian faith is the foundation for it, or the worldview in terms of which you use your reason. But Greg, you wouldn't defer to faith as being some mystical faculty or credulity. You're talking about uh, a, a belief based upon evidence then. Yes. And when people read the Bible and sing hymns, ancient of days who sittest throned in glory, Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. They still got that fellow up there with a beard on. It's way in the back of the emotions. And so we should think, first of all, in contrary imagery. And the contrary imagery is, she's black. Um, 
there have been plenty of Christians throughout history that have taken that mystical approach to faith. They've defined it as a, a second approach uh, to knowledge apart from man's reason and so forth. But I think those are misguided. Mm -hmm. I would say that faith is essentially a belief. And the reason we talk about faith and reason is because when we have faith, it means we are trusting somebody else's expertise in some area. That so much nothingness is built right in and is headed straight for us. So anyone who wants to ask the first question has to be willing to consider its corollary question. Um, and the certainty in the second case, unlike the first of, a, of an answer. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So if you think that all this is going on in these gigantic fields of gravity and light with you in mind, then you really do have a self-centeredness problem. <laughs>